Our next speaker is Caroline Brown. Her thesis is entitled, Many of these children are not like the other, ADD, ADHD's cultural construction and medicated bodies. In this paper, Caroline Brown contextualizes and critiques the increasingly normalized practice of medicating elementary students with ADD, ADHD in contemporary USA. Through a close reading of the No Child Left Behind Act, and engagement with Louis Altozer's theory of ideological state apparatuses, Foucault's notion of docile bodies, and critiques of education provided by the field of critical pedagogy, Brown both challenges the validity and necessity of the current rates of diagnosis and medication, but also fills a gap in the current scholarship by interrogating the contribution of the U.S. public education system to the normalization of this practice. A combination of discourse analysis and ideological analysis contextualizes the argument that ADD, ADHD is a cultural construct, a result of the reproduction of dominant capitalist ideologies in public education, which both encourages and necessitates the normalization of medicating students with ADD, ADHD. Caroline.
existence of the body is a subject of much importance to this paper, because it is not simply a biological presence, but a social, cultural, and political presence as well. Foucault puts it best when he says, quote, the body is directly involved in a political field. Power relations have an immediate hold upon it. They invest it, mark it, train it, torture it, force it, force it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs, end quote. The body is caught up in a series of power relations, constantly morphing and transforming it. Mental illnesses, or specific to the context of this paper, ADD, ADHD, are diagnosed according to the symptoms listed in the DSM. There have been several editions of the DSM, the most recent of which the DSM-5, which will be published in May of 2013. And as each edition is published, both the illnesses that could be diagnosed and the symptoms to which they are affili affiliated have changed. Modernism altered the medical field in a significant way by introducing the notion of universality. Medicine became based around the discoverable laws that could ultimately be applied to anyone, anywhere, and would still be relevant. Symptoms within the medical field are used as a means to delineate among possible bodily ailments, followed by physical tests through which the exact diagnosis can be ascertained. Second mythology underwent the same modernist conversion and invested in the belief of universality, but with one key difference. There are no physical tests that can provide material evidence for a diagnosis within psychopathology. The diagnosis of any mental illness, including ADD, ADHD, is completely subjective to the interpretation of the psychiatrist, psychologist, or physician who is attending to the patient. Symptoms do not act as an indicator in the case of ADD, ADHD, with the proof of physical evidence expected later, but are the only means by which a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD can occur. And since these symptoms are a result of changing social norms and cultural practices, demonstrated by revisions found in the DSM, ADD, ADHD is wholly dependent on the current cultural practices and expectations of an individual's performativity. Now, it is important to identify the location in which a student's body is most vulnerable, the U.S. public education system. The current environment of public education in the U.S. can be ascertained through a close study of the No Child Left Behind Act, or NCLB which is a representation of the current neoliberal approaches to schooling. The analysis of NCLB in this paper accomplishes two things. It identifies ways in which NCLB further strengthens the cultural construction of ADD, ADHD, while at the same time reinforcing the need for medication as a means of control over the student's body. The test preparation center at centered atmosphere that dominates schools under NCLB puts students in precarious positions as members of that environment. Although the law is structured in a way that holds the schools accountable for failure, this accountability trickles down to the student. Lack of success in standardized tests leaves students vulnerable to schools that are often desperate to achieve adequate yearly progress, or AYP, and therefore view these students as hindrances rather than students in need of help. The school's need for high test scores and the lack of a diverse and, and varied curriculum establish a very small box into which a student is expected to fit. It does not allow room for students with alternative learning strategies and strengths, or in fact for a student to have any weaknesses. Although unrelated to the topic of NCLB, savings meaning best describes how ADD, ADHD is constructed by culture in the following. Quote, the concept of ADHD is intimately tied up with our modern Western beliefs about childhood and child rearing. Social pressures build up certain expectations for children to live up to. Parents and other guardians, such as teachers, feel blamed when their children cannot be squeezed into a socially desirable box shape. Doctors as powerful priests of knowledge then define this problem medically and hey presto, a gravy train, for, train starts running for multi-million dollar pharmaceutical industry." End quote. Under NCLB, ADD, ADHD becomes a way in which to explain why students cannot achieve, achieve adequate scores on standardized tests. Because of the inability of students to fit into the predefined standard box established by NCLB, a reason that blames the, places the blame on them rather than the public education system becomes necessary. In order for a neoliberal agenda for education to succeed, the perception of what education should accomplish cannot be questioned. To avoid this, then, the students are blamed for their inability to achieve proficiency on standardized tests, and a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD explains away the structural responsibility onto the students. Consequently, the best form of management for ADD, ADHD becomes medication, and the bodies of students who are unable to fit into the box are reshaped and morphed so that they do. 
NCLB must be further contextualized, however, to establish how education as an institution is morphed and reshaped to reinforce capitalist ideology. As an institution that requires compulsory attendance, the school's relevance and significance within this topic is articulated through the theoretical concept of Louis Althusser's ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs. The coupling of NCLB and Althusser's ISAs is helpful because while NCLB helps construct an idea of what it is like to be a student within the current environment of public education in the U.S., Althusser's theory of ISAs provides an explanation as to why the school should come under analysis. Althusser recognizes the school as one of the most influential ISAs. Therefore, shattering the myth of education being outside of power and marking it as a reproducer of capitalist ideologies. Its reproduction of these ideologies leads to specific <coughs> expectations pertaining to students and what it means to be successful in the school. This is demonstrated within the school through an assumption that in order for a student to succeed in life, she or he must be prepared with skills that are labor production focused. The school reproduces capitalist ideology by approaching education as a tool to prepare students for the workforce, rather than encourage them to be thinking, critical citizens. The assumption that education must be a means to prepare students for the working world, which awaits them on the other side, demonstrates the school's role as an ISA because it exemplifies the imaginary relationship that ideology creates. Education and educators believe this is the best option for students because that is what their relation to ideology has made them believe. Ideology acts as if it is the real conditions of existence, but instead reflects the desires and will of the ruling class. Ultimately, it is ideology under which education operates, and not the real conditions of existence. And because ideology is able to pose as real, education functions under the assumption that its methods will help students succeed in the real world. Medication has become a modern form of discipline, and its increased use can be seen as an attempt to morph the student body to be more productive and efficient. Medication is the means by which culture induces docility in our students in order to fulfill the level of productivity and efficiency that capitalist ideologists have established as normal. The continual and compulsory attendance of students in school allows for dominant power relations to impose subjective and coercive force upon the bodies of students regularly, ensuring that students' bodies are molded and transformed into what is deemed productive and efficient by dominant ideology. Educational reform also deemed productivity and efficiency as a social need for students and established social efficiency as one of the dominant organizational curricular concepts. Although social efficiency as a principle applied to curriculum making, it accentuates the argument that the school as an institution seems to be increasingly using education as a tool to produce students or bodies that are able to function productively and efficiently within society. The school is, in fact, a tool used to accomplish coercive transformational force upon students' bodies as 